Hi folks. Um, in this lecture I'm going to cover section 16.1. It's actually going to be a fairly brief lecture, so maybe half an hour. Uh, but you know, we can all probably use a little, <laughs> little extra time. So that's, that's probably a good thing. What's going on in 16.1? Uh, it's about, well, we've been so far working with derivatives. Now we're going to start doing integrals, but in multivariable setting. So I, I just want to kind of recapitulate what's gone on so far. In one variable calculus, well, that is one input variable calculus, and then versus what happens in multivariable, which in this case just means two or three variables, input variables. So, um, well, in both of these, you have derivatives. I guess I don't want to write it on a funny angle like that. Let's just say derivatives right here. And typically here in a single variable world, y was a function of x, so the, the thing was written dy over dx. Or, or y prime. Now, in multivariable, the major thing that changed was that we had only partial derivatives. And the way those are written was with a slightly different version of the D. It looks like a backward six almost. So you might have, well, let's, let's think about uh, a function as the thing we're operating on. So derivative of the function, partial derivative of the function with respect to x, a partial derivative of the function with respect to y, and a partial derivative of the function with respect to z if you're in three variables. So definitely that many, or you wouldn't be talking about multivariable, but if you have three input variables, a function that's defined on all of space, then, then you have partial z as well. The, the things that kind of correspond to the y prime notation are when we indicate a partial derivative with just a subscript. So you say f sub x, f sub y, and f sub z. And then there's a, a third element of taking derivatives when you're in the multivariable world that is, well, it just wouldn't be appropriate in the single variable world. It's when you define the gradient of the function, this vector that you build by sticking the parcels into a into the components of a vector. I hope it's obvious that you, you really wouldn't need to talk about a gradient if there was only one variable. Because a vector that only has one thing in it is just, you know, it's sort of indistinguishable from that one thing. It's just a real number or a function of a real variable. Okay, so then what about integrals? Well, that's, that's sort of the job for today, is to figure out what, what about integrals. Let me uh, clear some space and, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about integrals in more depth. So in single variable, in the single variable world when we were doing integrals, they looked like this, usually definite integrals. A to B would be the limits, and you had the function stuck in there, and then there was a dx at the end. Now, um, let's take apart the, the elements of this. One thing is the integral sign, right? Um, it says integrate, but I usually, at least informally in my head, when I say, see that integral sign, I like to think of it as just add. There's a, there's a reason why that looks like an S, as in the word sum. You're adding little things up. Actually, a, a good way to think of it is the way some of the founders of this stuff thought of it, is you're adding a whole bunch of things that are essentially zero, but when you add them all up, you get something non-zero. So if you're, you're adding infinitesimal quantities in order to get a, an actual finite value.
Then there's the interval from A to B. That's the, the, what the, the limits really mean, right? That you've got an interval over which your function has to be defined and you're integrating, you're doing the integral across that interval. And then there's the dx of the end. Why is there a dx on the end of this expression? Um, when, I, when I'm teaching Calc 1, I always, I always tell people, just think of it as this is the left parenthesis and that's a, the right parenthesis. That is, that, the, the, that you're always just going to bracket a function with a, a, an opening thing that says you're integrating over this interval and a closing thing. But, you know, it, it almost always seemed to be kind of just a formal symbol we made. We didn't really need it. Well, now is when we're going to need it. We're going to actually uh, need dx and also dy and dz. All right, so how do things change? What are the, these three elements? How do they change? Well, the first, actually, the first thing is the function itself. I sort of left that out. When you're in the multivariable world, it'll be a function of two variables at least, or three. Um, integrating, you can actually sort of, the, the way to think of it is you, you add up in the x direction and then you add up in the y direction, or you add up in the y direction and then you add up in the z direction. You may, you may have to do multiple addings ups to, to figure things out in higher dimensions. So if you're in two dimensions, you're going to require two adding ups, and that's what they, they just make a duplicate of the integral side, double integral it's called. If you're in three variables, it'll be integral, integral, integral. Three in, three sides in a row. So at this stage, just think of these as, in, you know, in 1D you'll have one S, in 2D you'll have two S's, in 3D you'll have three S's, three integral signs. The integrals, you know, in 1D we're done over some interval. That's the, the interval A, B there. What does that correspond to if we're in in two dimensions. Um, well, it, it's actually going to become a region. We'll usually call it R. But that's some area in the xy plane. And if you're in three dimensions, well, it really gets hard to, to well, not that hard to visualize, but um, it's got to be a three dimensional version of a region. An interval is a one dimensional version of a region. A region is sort of the 2D version, and in 3D, well, it's some sort of volume. And people typically use call it D for domain, but you could also see V for volume. Um, what happens with the, the symbol at the end, the little dx that told us, it did tell, do something useful. It told us that x was the variable, but that would have probably been clear because the function had x as the, well, the variable inside of it. Well, when you're over a region, we usually call this dA. That is thought of, or the symbol should make you think about area. So this is a differential version of area. Now it turns out, when you're thinking about a differential chunk of area, an infinitesimal amount of area, the best way to think of it is it's a product of an infinitesimal width times an infinitesimal length. You have a little, little tiny x, little tiny y. The product of those gives you a little tiny bit of area. That's, at least informally, that's how you should say it. When you're over a domain and you're doing a triple integral, then you're going to have a differential volume at the end of your integral. Right? And maybe it's obvious what you would do from there. dx, dy, and dz would be multiplied together. I barely have the room for the z. Okay. I want to sort of think about dots in between those things. So that's that's sort of the rough version of things, how, how it's going to look when we integrate um, in 2D or 3D. We're going to have a double integral or a triple integral. We'll have a region over which the integral happens, or a domain if it's 3D. And the function, well, I said the function will be a function of either two or three variables. And, and finally, 
you, you're integrating with respect to a concept of area or a concept of volume, depending on how high the dimensionality of the thing is. So, I think the best way, oh sorry, I'm trying to take some toys out of my closet while I'm talking. Um, I think the best way to, to think about these new integrals, double and triple integrals, is in terms of Riemann sums. So let's, let's start by uh, remembering what a Riemann sum looks like in 1D. Uh, kind of a visual approach to it is to think about the Riemann sums based on well, how many divisions. Like here I had a, a smooth curve, we've got A and B, or the interval, ends of the interval we're working on. And I, I set it n equals four. So we just divide that region up in, into four pieces. And I used a left-hand Riemann sum, remember that stuff, where you, you go to the left side of the interval and you, write, you figure out what the functional value is and you pretend like the, the function was constant over that little sub-interval, delta x, y. Um, here's what it looks like when n is in eight. Hard time writing an eight. There we go. Um, and you've probably noticed that it gets a little better in terms of an approximation of the area. The, the error here is a little bit there, a little bit of area there, there's a little bit more here and here. But you know, it's, it's much better than the, the rather large areas, errors. You can see area that was left out in this graph. There's even some in, in that stuff where the correct function was relatively flat. So you got a lot more error, error in the area than you do here. And really what we're going for is we take a limit. We let n equals four, then eight. Well, it doesn't have to double like that, but in some way it passes to infinity. And when you, when you get to n equals infinity, what we're saying is you've really just got the area under the curve. Now, algebraically, these two guys look like sums, excuse me, sigmas, right? So a uh, sum that went from i equals 1 to n, whatever the n was, 4, 8, or 29, whatever you have it to be. And we evaluated f sub x actually at, it's, it's actually hard to say where you evaluate it, isn't it? <laughs> you, have to, you have to figure out when i is some number between one, uh, 0 and n, no, 1 and n, um, how far across this interval are we? I think I'm just going to write it as x sub i. There's an x coordinate that works with, with each i, right? And then there's also what, there's also the width of the, the little bars. We're basically adding up a whole bunch of little rectangles whose widths are, well, b minus a over n. And f sub x i is evaluated here, 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 here. Right. One of those places would be the x size. So what happens when, when, when we pass to the limit? That's when we get the actual integral. Integral from a to b of f of x dx. And the pieces of these two formulas are, are sort of um, I don't know, analogous. Right? b minus a over n, that is often called delta x. right? And when you pass through to the limit, it becomes dx. A sigma, that's the Greek letter for s. <laughs> I know it looks like an e, but it's really an s in Greek. And so that means a summation. And this is a fair version of the English letter for s, or the Roman letter for s, anyway. Um, it also sort of is supposed to make you think about a summation. In fact, I can make this, this correspondence precise by saying what we're doing is taking the limit as n goes to infinity of these Riemann sums to get that area. Well, a little harder to see in two variables. I, I have some 3D printed models that I'm going to try to hold up to the camera so you can see it fairly well. But unfortunately, they're in black plastic, so I don't know how well that's going to show. Maybe it's okay. That surface is actually the monkey saddle, which we looked at in the Sage Lab recently. You can see the place for a tail here and the place for legs there and there. Anyway, that's, that's a smooth surface over a region in the xy plane. There's a little square base that this thing has, right? This 
is that region divided up into Riemann sums. That's a the same monkey saddle. You should still be able to see the place for the tail and the place for the two legs, but it's all blockified. I mean, it looks like something from Minecraft, doesn't it? The idea is that now we have a, a delta x that's going up this way, and then a delta y that's the width of those guys. But each one of these things is probably a quarter of an inch on a side. Um, I love to, I, I usually call this the French fry picture. And the French fry picture you're looking at right now is the, the fat Western style French fries. But you can pass to, to stringy French fries. That is the same model, but with the, the blockification done much more finely. And the idea is you pass from coarse to fine and in the limit to smooth. So you can still think of this as a, as a process where we're doing finer and finer Riemann sums and in the limit getting to actual, actual smooth object. What is that smooth object? Well, here, the thing that we got at the, in the end, that was area under the curve. And um, there's some funny business if the curve drops below the x-axis, you can have negative area, for instance. But, but you know, still, with as long as you keep track of the sign of the things, so you, you'll have a total area under the curve, with some parts part being negative and some parts being positive. It can happen. What do we get when we change this up and make it 3D? My favorite picture here is to try to draw in this, the usual x, y, z stuff. So right there's the x axis, y going into the board, z going up. Um, I'm going to draw first a region in the x, y plane, and I'm just going to make it a square region. I do want these guys to look parallel. So. All right, so that's my region. I could try to label it so it looks like an R in perspective. That region is laying flat in the XY plane. Yeah. Um, it might be going from A and between A and B in the X direction and between C and D in the Y direction. Still, it's a, I know it looks like a parallelogram, but it's laying in the plane that's foreshortened, so that's that's a square region. Well, depending on the way I was drawing it, it's a square region. It really depends on what these particular numbers are. But at least it's rectangular. Okay. Now, sitting above that region, we'll have a surface. Now, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna draw a portion of the surface above these points, the corners of the thing. And I'm, now I'm gonna fill in what the actual surface maybe looks like. I'm, I'm trying, I'm hoping to get you to visualize something like the carpet, the flying carpet in Aladdin, you know, floating above this plane. So there would be there'd actually be a little of curve part of it there. But you know that you've got this this flexible surface line above it. This guy's equation is z equals some function of x and y. And what we get when we double integrate over this region, that function, is very analogous to the area under the curve, except it's the volume under the surface. There's, there's a region a volume in three-dimensional space that lies above the xy plane, but beneath the flying carpet. So the, this would be a double integral of the function x comma y over our region dA. I'll say it now. And what that represents is volume under the surface.
Now, I can't tell you how to visualize or how to think about the three-dimensional version of it. Um, I guess you could call it a hypervolume over a, over a domain, but it's, it's, it's harder to talk about it in, when you're in 3D because when you're in 3D, you're using all three variables that we can normally visualize by seeing things in 3D space. They're all three input variables, so they're sort of all lying down in the plane. And we need a fourth direction for the, the plotting of the surface. Not many people, I mean, maybe Einstein, maybe Stephen Hawking can visualize this stuff, but um, it turns out not to matter. We don't have to make any great leaps because there's a procedure that tells you how to integrate, and you just do the procedure one more time when you're in, when you're in three variables. So let's see that procedure next. That's, that's the kind of thing we're going to try to evaluate, the, getting the volume under a surface by saying we'll do a double integral over a region of this function of two variables with respect to area. And the first, well, the, the thing that actually makes this notation work is that we'll take dA to be the same thing as dx times dy. That is, you can just plug that in for where dA is. Now, what about the region? How do we understand the region? Well, you, you may think of that region, I showed it as a rectangular region with the x-coordinates going between a and b, and the y-coordinates going between c and d. You know? So if we drew it in the, in the flat, we'd have x goes from a to b, and y goes from c to d. So here's our region seen bird's eye view of our region. That's far no longer in perspective because I'm drawing it flat. Right? Well, all the pieces of, of this region can be turned into stuff that we work with the integral side. We just want the interval from A to B for X coordinates and the interval from C to D for Y coordinates. Let me, let me write how this all plays out. This thing up here is equal to a double arrow I'm just going to leave off the region for now. f of x, y, dx, dy. If you think about this inner stuff as being a regular 1D integral, that's a regular integral, We would just plug in the limits, A and B, on the integral side. So you put an A down below and a B up above. And so um, what I'm actually getting at, sort of beating around the bush to get to, is you may think about this double integral over a region as being the integral of an integral, or sometimes called an iterated integral. So what are you going to do with the, the outside s and the dy? That's going to be an integral with respect to y. That's what the dy on the end tells you. And the limits in the y direction are c and d. You know, something like this. Now, um, I don't know if you'll think about this right away, but many people would ask this question, what's so special about x that I did it first? <laughs> And the truth is, there's nothing special about x. You don't have to do x first. You can do y first if you like. In fact, you get to choose. And that's often really handy because um, sometimes doing one of the integrals first is hard, but doing the other one first is easy. So obviously, you, you take the route of least resistance. Um, what I was just alluding to is called Fubini's theorem. And there's a, there's a 3D analog of it, but I'm just going to state it for you in two dimensions. If you have an integral, um, let's stick with those same limits, c to d, integral a to b of f of x, y. Let's see, this would be dx, because it's got to match with x um, limits, and then dy. 
This is the same thing if you interchange the order of the integrals. So do a to b on the outside, c to d on the inside, f of xy, and now it would be dy dx. And well, what the, the theorem, I'm, we're not going to even think about the proof of this theorem, but, but the pragmatics of this theorem are that you can take whichever integral is, is you know, nicer, do it first, and then do the other one second. So what are these integrals I'm talking about? Well, the, the best way to think of it is you've got an inside integral. So your function, you're going to integrate x, you're going to integrate with respect, sorry, the way I've just, I just looked at it, and it's, the thing I just did was an integral with respect to y. So here we're going to integrate with respect to y and evaluate across the limits between c and d. And what's in parentheses will be something that in the end we'll evaluate to a function that doesn't have y's in it anymore, because the y's get evaluated. Well, well, I'll show you an example of this shortly, and then it'll, it'll probably come clear. But this, this thing inside the parentheses will only involve x variables. The y's will be gone. We say the y's get integrated out. That's a great phrase, I think. They get turned into numbers because you evaluate y, any y's that appear at d and at c, and you subtract just like you did in ordinary integrals. So the y's get integrated out. What's in parens then is simply a function of x. You're going to integrate those out next. <laughs> that is the second integral. That's, that's the, the, what I'm describing there is the concept of iteration. Integrate once on the inside and then integrate a second time on the outside. And if there were three variables, it'd be integrate, integrate, integrate. Working from inside to the outside. So let's let's do an example. Um, the example I want to do is a double integral over a region. I just made up a, a little formula in x's and y's. I'm going to do dx first and then integrate with respect to y. Um, and and, I, and I, over here I made a sketch of what the region is. It's a little square. Uh, one the bottom left corner that is at the origin. The upper right corner is at the point one one. So let's immediately stop talking about r and turn that into limits. I can't mess this up because they're both 0 to 1. Right? So that is going to give me some volume. This is certainly a surface. We got a z as a function of x and y laying above the xy plane, so above here. And then we get a volume beneath the surface but above the plane. I don't know what that volume is, but let's see. So the first thing I'm going to do is just, and normally I don't actually put these parentheses in, I'm just doing it for emphasis right now. We're going to take care of that integral. We're going to integrate this thing with respect to x. And when we're doing that, we have to figure out what to do with y. And the answer is, um, don't do anything with y. <laughs> Pretend y is a constant. We're going to basically, um, you should think about this is, is when we have this, uh, this Riemann sum kind of thing. If you integrate with respect to x, you're kind of turning one of these jaggedy things into something smooth. That's a nice one. But now there's a bunch of these smooth things. And then we'll integrate the other way, and, and that'll take all, the, all those smooth things, which were, kind of looks like sliced bread, if you... If you can imagine that, you know, you'll have smooth surface along this way, but then there's slices, so there, there's a jaggediness in one direction, a smoothness in the other. Anyway, the second integral adds, takes the, the thickness of the slices and makes it go to zero in the other direction. And yeah. So in any one slice, y would be a constant. That's what we're, the way we're going to think about this. So if y is a constant, let's just integrate a constant times x plus x squared dx. I have to recopy this piece, the outer integral that remains to be done, right? But I think we can integrate the inner piece. What's a, a constant times x? 
It's that same constant times x squared over 2. And x cubed becomes, sorry, x squared, I was getting ahead of myself, x squared becomes x cubed over 3. And that's the antiderivative, which you remember how this works? You have to evaluate that at the upper endpoint and then subtract what's happening at the lower endpoint. You should normally write like that. Now, the, the low endpoint is great for us because 0 in for x cubed or for x squared is going to make both of those terms 0. Yeah, so, so we'll be subtracting 0. So we just have to evaluate at the upper endpoint. And that's pretty nice for us, too, because 1 squared is 1 and 1 cubed is 1. All right, so you just have to integrate from 0 to 1. y over 2 plus 1 third with respect to y. Well, certainly, I mean, that, that act of treating y as a constant made this thing be pretty easy to figure out. Now that, that is a Calc 1 problem. y over 2 becomes, what, y squared over 4? Any derivative is y squared over 4. And 1 third becomes y over 3. And we will evaluate that between 0 and 1. Again, the lower limit, 0, just those are gone. And at the upper limit, we get 1 fourth plus 1 third. 7 twelfths, I think it is. 1 fourth plus 1 fourth, that'd be 3 twelfths, 4 twelfths, yeah, 7 twelfths. Final answer. I probably better do another one of those. This is uh, example four from the textbook, page 1014. The, the function involved, a little bit tougher now, y times e to the xy. The region is still a rectangle, but I, I, I wanted to at least have you once in, in this see um, a way to define the region with it, rather than drawing a picture of it. This is the set builder notation for it. Um, we're talking about points xy in the xy plane uh, that satisfy these two conditions x is between 0 and 1, inclusive, because it's less than or equals, and y lies between 0 and ln2, inclusive. All right, so what would the, error, or the volume under this function over this region look like? Well, it's this double integral. Actually, there's two of them that I want to write down. Uh, both of them will have y times e to the xy in them. Well, of course, the, maybe it's obvious that to you what I'm doing. The difference between these is going to be one does dx first, then dy. And the other will be vice versa. So how, do we, how does that affect the limits in these double integrals? Um, this one has the x limits on the inner guy, so it goes from 0 to 1. This one has the x limits on the outer guy, possibly 0 to 1. And so uh, the other things are 0 to, excuse me, natural log of 2. Now, uh, what do you think will be easier to integrate first? That's really the big question. Um, and to answer that question, we, we should just examine the inside integrals. Um, you know, what would this inner integral entail? And what would this inter integral entail? Um, I think you'll have done this in Calc 2 fairly recently. So if you, if, you know, except it might not have looked quite like this with your y's as the variables, but if you had x times e to a constant times x integrated with respect to x, let me, let me, this is worth it, I shouldn't just say it, let me write it for you. What would this be about if you were doing the integral of x times e to a constant times x dx?
How could you do that? Well, yeah, that's right. Integration by parts. You'd have to let uh, u equal x dv equal e to the kx dx. Then uh, du would be dx. That's good. And v would be actually have to integrate e to the kx. Oh, that's not so bad because you get uh, I forget how the constant works. No. Yeah, you have to do a use. Okay. I'm already kind of not happy, right? What if we try the other way around? What if we did the one with respect to x first? Then I've got a constant times e raised to the x times a constant. That's how I should think about it. Let's think how we would integrate that. Same, same question, though. Could we integrate a constant times e to the constant times x dx? Yes, I believe I can do this one, I, and it's quick. You would, sit, you would do a u substitution, that u equals kx, then du would be k dx. Right? Cool, because there's k and there's dx, that's my du, and here's e to the u. What, what we've got there is integral of e to the u du. And so, because e to the u is its own integral, you get e to the u, which is e to the kx. That wasn't that. This made me want to start crying. So, well, not. Okay, I'm I'm joking a little bit here, but certainly if you if you're going to have to do integration by parts versus another one, you would have to do just a simple substitution. The substitution one is preferable. All right, so let's let's go back and actually do it in the correct order. There's the order I wanted, with the x happening first, because that if you think of x the variable, y is just constants in both of those. That's the easy substitution. I just did that integral, didn't I? So we, we got e to the xy. And that will be evaluated between 0 and 1. Actually, I like to sometimes in these remind myself what variable is getting evaluated at 0 and at 1. Those are values for x, right? So that's what the result of the integral on the inside is. And then we would Take that answer and integrate it from 0 to log 2 with respect to y. So what was this thing evaluated at 0? e to the 0 times y. Well, e to the 0 is 1. That's a 1 at the lower limit. And when x is 1, this is just e to the y, isn't it? So that is, we've got e to the y minus 1 integrated from 0 to actual log of 2 dy. Okay, press there. Yeah, all right, so that's not bad. e to the y's integral is e to the y. 1's integral is y, evaluating between these limits. Now it's clear that y is the variable, so I'm not going to bother writing variable equals limit here. Um, at the upper limit, we get e to the ln 2, that's just 2, minus ln 2. And at the lower limit, we get e to the 0, which is 1, minus 0. Huh. Uh, well, the minus 0 doesn't matter, so that's just a 1 on the end. 2 minus 1, that's 1. And minus ln 2 has nothing that it's going to cancel with. Minus ln 2. There's your answer. I think we could have eventually got it by doing the other order and doing the integration by parts first, but this definitely would seem preferable. So that's... The object lesson here is pick your order. Pick the one that's going to give you the least trouble. Uh.
there is one last little tidbit in this chapter that I think is, is worth doing. You may recall in Calc 1, we talked about the average value of a function over a region, over an interval. It was just, it's, it's a nice application of, a, of an integration problem. What you do is divide by the length of the interval. B minus, 1 over B minus A times the integral from A to B of F of X. One, uh, one way I'd like to think about this, have people ever seen ant farms? An ant farm is usually just two sheets of glass separated by maybe half an inch and you fill it all with sand and then you put ants in. And it's fun because the ants will dig into the sand and make little cavities where they lay eggs or store food or whatever and you can watch them doing their stuff. But um, if you imagine an ant farm filled with like ice, you know, you get some, you've got a frame that holds a function but the, you know, it's liquid that has been frozen in place, so it's got some shape to it. The idea of the average function, the average value of the function is simply heat this thing up, melt the ice, and figure out what water level will you be at. So this is before melting. And the jaggedy line, like it's still water, so it ripples. That's after melting. Well, the function value is this stuff. The average of it is that is that height. Um, how do we see that they're the same? This integral here is the area. And if the area is the integral from a to b of f of x dx, but it's also it's also the average value of the function, let's call it f bar times b minus a. So how do you figure out f bar? Take that integral and divide it by the b minus a, which is what I said here. Having created a name for that, now we should probably use it up above. f bar is equal to the average value of a function over an interval. Very useful in a lot of contexts. Um, you can do the same thing in two variables and three variables. It's just what you divide by is slightly different. Let's just talk about the two variable case. So I'll take the average value of a function of two variables over a region R. It's just going to, let's call it F bar again because it's it is still the average value of a function. You're going to take the double integral over the region of f of x, y, d, d, a, and you're going to divide by the area of the region. And if the region happens to be rectangular, that's with limits a, b, and c, d, that's, that's just going to be b minus a times d minus c. Right in there. All right, that should, uh, that should be a good place. That is a good place to stop because it's literally the last thing mentioned in section 16.1. So um, I'll get this thing in the can by not too terribly late on Sunday night. And uh, hopefully everybody gets a chance to watch before Monday morning. Bye-bye.